Hi, Peter Boyles, of course, former talk show host, 710 KNUS, as we are right next door. And this, of course, is The Shoot. And it's been a true gift to me to keep me in the game, but I get to meet remarkable people and I get to read great books and I get to sit and talk to them on YouTube. Uh, this is James Martin and he's a professor at the University of Houston. And he's absolutely brilliant and I have become like this little geek about the Revolutionary War and his book is the top 10 and his key campaigns of the Revolutionary War. So I'm reading his bio and it turns out he was also, a, a, when he was at Rutgers, he was involved as a scholar with Thomas Edison. First of all, Professor, thank you for doing this. It means a lot to me and uh, welcome to the shoot and thanks for doing it. Thank you, thank you very much and I'm very glad to be here and looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, all right, Thomas Edison, good guy or bad guy in relative spe speaking? My view of Edison was that he was a driven man um, and he was not always the nicest person around but uh, he didn't like people standing in his way in, in his various attempts to invent all sorts of things that we live with today, not the least of which uh, is the importance of the electricity that we're all operating under. Um, and you can go to movies, you go to so many other areas. And, and in the end, he probably wasn't the nicest guy to be around, but that had to do with his determination to get things done while he could get them done. And, uh, at times they have some money challenges and that sort of thing. So he's a hard-nosed businessman, I guess that would be one way, but uh, incredibly successful and uh, really, really in so many ways has had a major effect on our lives as we're living them even today. I often think how people fit into time. Is he a Bill Gates character? Is he a, uh, a Musk character? Uh, where does he fit in, in that sort of mindset? Well, it, that's, that's a very good question. Um, maybe I would see him more as a developmental must type of individual, um, determined to make certain kinds of changes that would, in, in so many ways, improve our lives, uh, but expected at the same time to be recognized uh, and, if nothing else, be thanked for those contributions. And I think that's a very important part of it. But, there aren't a lot of these kinds of individuals around. Individuals around, uh, they are entrepreneurs. There's no doubt about that. But they also have brilliant minds, and they see connections and things that we don't necessarily. The rest of us out there don't necessarily put together. The one and one for us may be two, but for one and one for them may have possibly a twenty-two or something like yeah, that. No. In terms of advancing um, technology and whatever whatever else it might be along that line, so incredibly important individuals to say the least and in many ways I think worthy of our attention. I always believe this about history. There are people that come along. Einstein, Picasso, um, Jefferson. We're going to talk about Jefferson and they just see it differently. And I, and I always saw those pictures. There's Harvey, we, we're talking, the uh, professor grew up in Akron, Ohio, outside of Akron. There's Harvey Firestone, there's uh, all these guys and they're camping together, Henry Ford and, and Edison and others. You think, wow, you know, what must that have been like? And they were friends, or I believe they were friends. That's right, they were. Uh, and they, they did enjoy each other's friendship and I think they enjoyed the sharing of ideas. They, they had different kinds of skills in different kinds of uh, areas when, when you think about the contributions, but uh, uh, there's, there's no doubt that they were a special and a kind of a unique talent um, that in so many ways, as I've already said, well, just think of the automobile. Oh, yeah. Mass massively today. And yeah. before, uh -huh. very simple system of assembling uh -huh. them out an assembly line, that kind of a contribution in and of itself, and how, how much that's affect our lives each uh -huh. and every day. And also another flawed human being, Henry Ford. Um, that's right. John D. Rockefeller. I mean, these guys are, uh, and it brings me to history. We were talking before we began to do the shoot about these remarkable men who made this country. And there's a school of history called revisionism and people can name it whatever they want to call it. But you have concerns and I, I share them. What's gonna, we have the 250th anniversary of the country coming. We have all of these remarkable men and we look back at, again, Harvey Firestone, or it doesn't matter, Nelson, Ro Nelson, John Rockefeller, how they're treated. And 
Speak to that if you would. Well, as a group, so many of these individuals we we have discussed have been dismissed for a long time as the robber barons, and that mm -hmm. is, while they were making major contributions on the technological side, they were apparently stealing uh, from everyone in the process. Uh, they weren't treating their employees correctly, and on and on and on. Uh, and I think I think that relates somewhat to what is going on today, uh, in the sense that there is there is uh, this feeling that in our modern world there are only two types of individuals the oppressors and the oppressed there mm -hmm. aren't very many oppressors but they tend to fall into the category the, the male white male category and then the oppressed tend to be uh, defined in terms of all sorts of uh, minority groups uh, and that that idea is there and it's in play we call it critical race theory if we want to use mm -hmm. that specific term uh, and it and it really is in many ways dominant right now certainly yeah. in the academic world that's true um, in so many other sectors so whether you, whether you get into primary and secondary education in another area it really becomes a matter of are we trying to teach are we trying to understand are we trying to indoctrinate and many individuals who are involved involved in the critical race theory side are as much into indoctrination oh. as they are anything else yeah. I believe it's part of when you read Marx and you see how they apply the dialectic, they're applying the dialectic again. Um, the clash of the underclass. And, uh, and uh, I, mean, I don't know if you see it that way or not, but it's, well, to me, it's, yeah. Well, I was just going to say if you take a Marx, uh, the dominant factor is class structure. Sure. Uh, and what critical race theory has done, it's, it's not the class structure goes away, it may be there in the background, but now it's really racial structure yeah. that is what is the driving variable in everything, and that is the dominant fact of life. And so you get into these situations where, let's say, take in the early 19th century, you have a very active abolitionist movement, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, and that, that movement uh, in and of itself involved a tremendous number of very dedicated white people who saw the evils of slavery and wanted to eliminate it, wanted yeah. to do something about it. But the way this somehow comes out today is that because you have this division, sharp division of oppressors and oppressed, that you're now in the kind of a situation uh, where those white people who were so important in trying to put an end to slavery sort of get shoved into the background. I think the almost obvious example, even Abraham Lincoln's in trouble these days. Sure, of so, course he is. Yeah, of course. So, so that is the kind of thing that is going on. And whether that is good history or not, that that can be debated. I understand that. But mm -hmm. uh, in my own, what I hope is a thorough reading with uh, some 50 years uh, in the in the professoriate, uh, we've got some issues we need to really work out. We need to get back to certain mm -hmm. kinds of themes that have been lost along the way. Uh, last shoot we did last week was with Meltzer, and we were talking uh, about banning books. And one of, if not the earliest banned book in America, was uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Uncle Tom's Cabin. And it became w way before going after Sawyer and going after Huckleberry Finn, as we watch today. They they went after that that book, in which was a a catalyst apparently for a lot of the the feelings and particularly in the north about to end slavery and i get lost in this stuff because i, I do see it the dialectic now is skin color as opposed to underclass or class struggle and i don't know where it ends up do you, any sense of this well in many ways interpretations or schools if we use that term schools of interpretation True. come and go Let's say in the 19th century, the dominant school of uh, interpretation was almost like we shall be as a city upon a hill, the eyes of yeah. people are upon yeah. us, that yeah. we're a great society and we're trying to make a better world for everyone. Well, that would be considered very passe today, and now mm -hmm. we're into uh, a school of historiography where uh, America it can apparently do no good, but can do a great deal of yeah. evil, not yeah. only inside yeah. the country, but across the globe. And, one of the ironies of this, from my point of view, it's so simple. We've got hundreds of thousands of immigrants 
coming into the country illegally into a country well, that we're being told by the same yeah. people who want them to come is probably one of the crummiest and worst countries in the oh, world. No, I agree. I mean, it's the... It doesn't make any sense to me at no, all. No, the, the contradiction's yeah, insane. Place. Yeah, That's I mean, it's crazy. When taking back into the, you know, your focus on the American Revolution, why do these men rebel? I mean, I, I finished some, some lengthy his, 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 historians talking about what leads up to ultimately we are the country that rebels against the crown. Um, what, what fuels these men and why? Well, that is a complex question. There's no doubt about it, uh, because if I could put it this way, if you have a population of two plus million in the 13 colonies in 1774 and 1775, different people are gonna to come to different, different conclusions. They're gonna have different reasons. Um, but there is kind of a common vocabulary out there that uh, you find in all the, well, so many documents, especially by those who will be leading the revolution. And that is a fear of a conspiracy on the part of the British crown, the king and parliament and the king's advisors to destroy American liberties. And that they, they view that through the prism of acts like, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the Boston Tea Party, or through the Townsend duties, trade duties, yeah. Uh, or through the uh, other kinds of acts that are out there, uh, such as the Stamp Act in 1765. Mm -hmm. And that's not the only kind of thing. Uh, closing the frontier is another big issue. And you can go through all of those issues and different individuals will come to different reasons. But if you take even someone like George Washington, why would he who has so much of everything as, as an elite leader in society, why would he go ahead and rebel? It wasn't because he was necessarily thinking uh, that he's going to make a lot of money on this, no. or that he's going to gain a lot more power, but he's really genuinely concerned about the values and uh, a loss of, a generalized term, the loss of public virtue. That is where we mm -hmm. can end up literally being in a state of political slavery, and that is important in the context of actually having shadow slavery yes. because you see what it's like and you see you don't want to be put in that kind of a position where you're totally dependent on someone else or whatever good there is in life. And so I think those kind are the kind of factors that do come into play. It becomes a kind of a, a, a commonality among at least enough of the population. They say enough is enough is enough yeah. when you send troops in as they did in Boston in significant numbers. Uh, and this is first but the second time in 1774 and into 1775, when you strip the government of Massachusetts of its, uh, what we would describe as its legitimate charter, this is all, these were all these signs of tyranny, and we're going to end up in some form of, of worst case scenario, a military dictatorship, if we don't stand up and resist. When that moment comes and you talk about Concord and, and, and Cambridge, and when that moment comes, when the shots fired and I've been there, I've walked at and uh, you can feel those guys, they're there. And this, and it's in many ways, they're coming for the powder and they're coming to and uh, disarm these, these rebels and it blows up in their face. Um, speak to that, if you would, please. I think that had a lot to do with British attitudes. Yeah. There's an attitude on the part of you know, so many of the uh, key leaders, including military figures, that the Americans would cut and run at the sign of a bayonet or the yeah. sign of a few musket balls flying their way. Uh, and that's, that's really captured um, in secret orders that were sent to uh, General Gage, who was in command in Boston in 1775. And the orders say that you're dealing sir with a rude rabble without yeah. plan without concert why aren't you just going ahead and putting it to these people and showing them the strength of british arms and that really so gage is ordered basically to go and demonstrate in some way the power of british arms well he doesn't pick a very good plan when he decides to go out and uh, into the countryside uh, mm -hmm. into uh, lexington and concord uh, and capture enemy weaponry that's really one of the goals and to show them that because the whole thing falls apart on the 19th of april in 1775 and the americans if you just take the statistics at the end of the day and, and these are guesses on my part the british had 
close to 300 casualties that day, and the mm -hmm. Americans were under 100 when you add yeah. it up. So right there, you've demonstrated the Americans have the capacity to stand up if they are willing to do so. And that then also raises the question, will they be willing to do so over the next several years? And, and also what strikes me about this character of, of us is the British have done this to the Irish. They've done it in India. They've done it in places literally around the, 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 the sun never sets on the empire. What was it about these guys? And it wasn't the Irish were afraid to fight or wasn't that the other people were not afraid to rebel. But these guys, is it because they were, they were armed? Was it because of the Second Amendment, eventually becomes the Second Amendment? Is it because they were, they were willing? And I think, because that's a, a spark. And I've always looked at that moment and said, why? Well, I think part of it had to do with the British assumption that the Americans really wouldn't stand up. After all, they didn't have experience. You just mentioned experience. I'm not trying to pick on the Irish here. They've no, had experience no. with the Irish. They have experience with uh, uh, India. Oh, yeah. Uh, they, were able, they were able to pretty much run over people. Absolutely. So they, that, that, kind of, that kind of we are superior attitude, that these colonists are really our inferiors, uh, that they're outlanders. They don't really measure mm -hmm. up to us in so many ways. Yeah. And they didn't understand that a guy like George Washington or a person like Thomas Jefferson or Samuel Adams in Boston were not outlanders. No. Or, and I could name several others at, 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 to, to make this point, that they were willing to think through, they were willing to stand up, and they were willing to understand that with, with what resources they had, that they could marshal them in such a way as the foil British strategy. And that, that begins right 1775 into 1776. It's self-evident the British strategy is we're going to send armies into Canada, drop them south mm -hmm. uh, uh, through the Lake Champlain area. We're going to send army, as it will happen. We're going to send a large army, 35,000 plus, into the New York City area. We're going to move them north. We're going to cut off New England from the rest of the provinces by just taking advantage of the geography. We'll move eastward through New England. We'll wipe up, wipe out, wipe, sorry, wipe out the the source of the rebellion because so much of the agitation starts in Massachusetts and greater New England. So that factor is there and, and so there's a sense that we aren't going to be easily defeated even if they have superiority in so many ways. We'll just take it. The Americans didn't have a navy, they had a little bit, but compared to the strength of the British Navy, um, they had a very hard time marshalling trained troops. After all, British forces are well trained. Uh, in the art of war as it then existed. The Americans are more in a militia kind of a tradition or we'll get behind a tree and take a pot shot and retreat. Oh, yeah. We can't retreat to the point where we have to stand up. And these things all do come into play. Um, and I think there's an understanding on the part of Washington and others, we just have to persevere. Yeah. Uh, even if only a very small number of us persevere, they can't defeat us so long as we really have military forces in the field and that was that was the real key because in the end the british aren't able to tackle the army the the Connecticut. Uh, i'm sorry not the Connecticut, but the, it's part of the Connecticut, but the continental army uh, that is operating up into uh quebec province in canada uh there's going to be another branch of the army will develop in the south there's the main army with washington there's so many places where we have to hit that they can't, they can't accomplish it in an orchestrated fashion. And that becomes part of the, I guess we can call it the strategy on the part of the Americans, Patricia, just wearing them out, wearing them out, wearing them out. Doesn't history, again, hold up um, Vietnam or Algeria or, you know, you, you, you pick it, I'll play it, as long as we don't lose. It's not a question of winning, it's as long as we don't lose and standing up to the first world power, whether it's in Indonesia with the French or Algeria with the French, or as we speak right now, Ukraine. Right. Um, I don't know the outcome of this, but uh, Chechnya may be the, what the future looks like, but as long as we, and they, if they continue a protracted guerrilla war as you know, the, the Iraqi model inside, the, the, the Russians are gonna lose. Um, 
uh, one way or the other. Yeah. It's amazing that <clears throat> they, what are we day wise? I don't know, 50, 60, no. yeah. Or, yeah. Way beyond what anyone expected oh. to have. And, and there's one of the things that, you know, in, the, in the study of war, and you know, I even taught at West Point for a while. So I mean, I've got a little bit of knowledge in this area. And I've actually studied the first and second Chechnya wars from the late 1990s and into the early uh, 2000s. Uh, I think we just published, okay. Thought we lost our picture, but we didn't. Uh, and if, if you take this, there's what's called the will of the people. And so Absolutely. long as the will of the people is there, so long as that hasn't been destroyed, and that's what Putin is trying to do right now with all the yeah. various activities and the attacks on civilians, break the will of the people down and they'll say, okay, we've had enough, we quit. So long as that will is there, there is hope for Ukraine. What and strikes me, I'm sorry, please apologize. You know, I, I just wanted to make that oh. a fundamental point that uh, that's what's so very, very important in these situations. And there's a history of that. It's not just oh, today. Yeah. But it, you didn't break the will of the, the English uh, with uh, all the bombing of London. I was going to uh, bring it up, the Blitz. They didn't, they, the Blitz is a perfect example. Uh, we, yeah. On the other hand, you couldn't, you really couldn't break down the Germans when the Germans were being bombed heavily. Agreed. Kept, kept at some capacity, like it or not, to keep that population going. When the B-52 raids began on Hanoi, the will of the yeah. people strengthened. Uh, what's right. interesting that Putin, whose grandma, I've read a bunch of Putin books, but his grandma died of diphtheria in the siege of, Lenin, of, of Leningrad. Um, he didn't, what, what has he not learned from his mother, father, grandparents, Stalingrad, Leningrad? They, they didn't break their will. And, and you're, you're, I mean, we're, I know that you've studied and it finally takes atomic bombs to break the will of the Japanese people. Yes, that's, that's, right. a, that's an amazing factor in my abilities to try and read the Revolutionary War. They, they, there were dark nights, terrible dark nights. Valley Forge is a dark night. Okay. But they're able, they're, why were they able to go on, Professor? What was it about the character? Well, let me maybe just talk a little bit about changing technology that what was lacking in the 18th century that we have today is the total knockout punch. Today we yeah. call it atomic warfare. There was yeah. nothing like that even remotely related to that. I mean, a good artillery piece might be able to shoot a cannonball, I don't know, a thousand yards at most, maybe not even yeah. that far. Maybe yeah. that's way too far. But um, the technology was so limited in a certain way, you really did have to find the means to get those forces out in the field and let it be decided by hand-to-hand -hand combat. Because you didn't have to worry about bombs coming down on top of you from Ohio. Uh, you didn't have to, especially on land, you didn't have to worry about naval forces, although they could do some you know, f firing uh, from coastlines and that sort of thing. So there, there are technological limitations. The, the basic weapon is the musket. You throw in the, you throw in the bayonet. Uh, you did have long rifles with more accuracy, with a little bit of rifling in them, so you had you could you could actually aim at a target rather than just lay down fire. But you really couldn't affect the knockout punch in the way that you can today. And I think that's one of the factors that come because that goes back to fighting a war of attrition. If we just keep standing up, we just we'll get through the winter at Valley Forge. If we'll just get through uh, the winter at Morristown, probably the worst of the yeah. war in 1779 1780 in terms of in terms of the weather if you just can get through those points and just keep some semblance and washington understood this because he struggled to keep that army in the field because people are getting worn out uh they're also uh sick and tired of all the suffering out there. and they're going home yeah they're going yeah, home I mean, that, so yeah. i mean they, they but but somehow they're able to rally and that maybe goes to a factor may not talk about enough, and that is effective leadership. Yeah, I'm a huge Washington fan. When I began this quest five, six, seven years ago to attempt to understand this, which has now become <laughs> almost impossible to put my arms around it, but I, I rank George Washington, well, without George Washington, there is no other presidents. And I have he and Abraham Lincoln and one or two other, you know, great American presidents. But 
you know, we, every, it, Washington gets played down, you know, he owns slaves and he did this and he did that. He's a remarkable, remarkable man. Your thoughts? Yes, he did own slaves. Yeah. And a couple of thoughts along the line. First of all, slavery is a worldwide institution in the 18th century and is widely accepted. Some people actually believe or being taught that slavery began in the United States and it was the only place no. where actually that is such total nonsense it's of beyond course. belief. It's a, it's a statement of really ignorance, if, not, if yes. nothing else. The second thing, Washington was a part of his world and was a part of his culture. Slavery was commonplace as an economic system, not just in the colonies, but the worst slave systems were actually in South America. If you wanted to count up yeah. the deaths and the rapid deaths and people being worked to death, go to Brazil. Brazil, I, indeed. I, oh, absolutely. Exact numbers, but yeah. something like four million slaves were imported into Brazil and they die rapidly. And then by comparison, I think the total imported into the United States was in the four to 500,000 range, 10 times or whatever that would be, and way beyond 10 times. Yeah. My math is pretty pathetic. Yeah. Uh, and, and these things, Washington was in his world. And it's like people can't understand that, and I, I use this line quite a bit, the past is like visiting a foreign land. They do mm -hmm. things differently there. Yeah. Yes. And they have different values and cultures. And what is amazing about Washington, just a couple of factors. Number one, he had great power, but he never abused it. That was a gift that is going to keep on giving, to use that silly expression. Yeah. All through our history, it's given, 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 and it's still giving today. And the second thing he did, he learned over time that slavery was not, chattel slavery was improper. And he did his best to set an example upon his death. He could only free a number of his slaves because most of them belonged to Martha through the property arrangements yeah. of that time. Yeah. But he tried to set an example for which he's given no credit or it's dismissed. Well, why didn't he do more? Well, in the context of his times, my statement, counter statement would be he did a great deal by that statement alone. There's a term that I, I use, or they were men of their times. And to take 2022 April standards and apply them to either Christopher Columbus or any series of people is not only it's cookie cutter number one, number one, but number two, it's it's illegitimate. You can't take these were men of their times. This is what they believed. This is what they thought. And to reach back with your hand. 200 years, 200, almost 50, 250 years, and pluck these guys, or in Columbus's case, over 500. They were who they were. Is that is that fair, Professor? I think that's very fair. And let me put it this way. A lot of history that's being written today is very present-minded and agenda-driven. Yeah. Very good. And that if someone has an agenda, I am going to take George Washington and knock him apart uh, and say how awful he was because of so, the, uh, the slavery issue and not look at the rest of everything or the yeah, culture yeah. of the time because they're making a statement today. And that goes back to, if I could interject critical race theory, this is the way you support this kind of I, I just historical blindness in the sense that it's not really history, it's really modern day, as we could, I think, fairly call it propaganda with a modern political purpose. And sometimes One of the it's be driven politically as well, obviously. Oh, one of the, as a reader, and then along comes these people that get d dubbed the atomic historians, William Appleman Williams, David Alporowitz, and they began in the 60s during the, the height of Vietnam, while the United States was racist and dropped this atomic bomb on the Japanese. They would have never done it to the Germans, which is nonsense. The bomb wasn't ready. But they go on and on and on and on. Uh, the predicator of the Cold War. We, we showed Joe Stalin we would do this. And it's wonderful reading, but when you read all the primary documents, we saved lives, not only American lives, but Japanese lives. Is that an example? I mean, it's one of the examples that I use of, hey, you know, we can revise as much as we want, but where's the truth? Right. I think that, I think those are certainly very reasonable examples to yeah. use. Um, and 
this notion of the, this, this whole argument about dropping the bomb. Yeah. Was this was this a fair and kind thing to do? Um, how many? Li- it gets down to lives. Yeah, well, sure. In, 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 I always think of that at the beginning of the Patton movie. Yeah. Where Patton comes out, and he yeah. says, and I'm, "I'm paraphrasing here." Where he yeah, says, huh? "Your job isn't to get killed. Your job is to kill the other guy." That's and right. this is this is where we to sacrifice a million Americans for the sake of saving. Eighty or a hundred thousand Japanese, because yeah, these are the kind of numbers you're talking about in total war, and that's what we're into it at the end of World War II is a phase yeah. of total war, and that was going on in Germany too. I mean, uh, take the, take the bombing of Dresden; that's been turned into a disaster. Where yes, hundreds of thousands died, which is not true. I've actually yeah. written about that subject. Yeah. Love to talk to you about that sometime. As a matter we will. of fact, we will. And, and anyway, <laughs> what I can tell you is, which side? Ultimately, in war, a lot of not nice things are going on. Hmm. That's reality. Yeah. Look at what's going on with, with discovering civilians murdered today in the sure. Ukraine. That's horrible. Yeah. There's no doubt. Yeah. But that's also part of war. And that's another subject we can get into it sometime. But the point I'm trying to make is that you have to look at this from the Allied point of view, and that is, did you want to win the war? Yeah. How are you going to stop the Japanese who refused to stop short of almost seeing their society obliterated? And that goes back to that, how do you break the will factor, which is really in a much smaller way is going on in the Ukraine today. I, I, I've read this theory called the Samson effect, where you pull the building down on top of yourself. You die in the middle of it. I'm watching that happen in a lot of the American political scene with these crazy people who will pull this down on top of themselves. In the end, they're in the bunker in, in Berlin, and it's Gotterdamrung. It's the, it's that crazy, and how crazy it must have been in the palace in Tokyo. And after they do it the first time, they don't believe it. They do it the second time, and I read LeMay's bio, and they sent for the third bomb. They think, hey, we're going to have to do this to them again and they give it up. And how many young men and women lives were saved? That's right. On no our one side. will know. Yeah, That's on right. our side, let alone right. Japanese Japanese no. lives. That's right. That's right. And it's true, yeah. even on the Japanese side, which is not usually oh. factored in, no. because if we had had a major invasion in Japan, oh. how many millions? Maybe our estimate is a million on our side. That's what the war planners oh. were saying. Right. But right. on their side, how many more? Maybe yeah. many, many more than the, the hundred, whatever it is, hundred and fifty thousand or so in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I mean, these are yeah. these are huge subjects, and they're diffi- oh. they're difficult to well, they're difficult to comprehend in many ways. But I think it's important to treat these subjects fairly, and most importantly, in context, not out yeah, of context. I, I, we began with Concord, Yorktown. I read your book, and I've read other things about Yorktown is a siege. You know, once again, I was, I have no, I had no reference to just, oh yeah, Yorktown, uh, they surrendered. But that, that was, uh, and, and the, the Revolutionary War in the South was the most brutal. Again, we think about crossing the Delaware, we think about Concord and, and Cambridge. The South, with guys like Francis Marion and those guys, that was incredibly brutal, was it not? Yes, it was. The, in many ways, the most brutal areas of the war would be in the South and all yeah. that campaigning that goes on, uh, more or less beginning in uh, 17, late 1778, early 1779, as forces move into the South, because the British, after uh, the Saratoga battles, basically, yeah. they're finished in the North. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's been settled. Yeah. Uh, and, and then the other area where there is incredible brutality is out west uh, in wars that involve loyalists, uh, Native Americans, Indians. Uh, in fact, I'm doing working on a subject right now about what turned in, in the debate among today is, was this really a massacre? Well, in this particular ba- battle in the Wyoming Valley, in, in, uh, this occurred in July 1778, they took hundreds of scalps. I mean, that, that's the nature. I mean, this... This was, if you don't want to call it a massacre, at least call it a slaughter, because yeah. this is what was going on. And these are very, 
very, very vicious. The, the kind of controls that you would expect in warfare were not there in the South and in the West, especially in those two areas, because it was kill or be killed. It was, it was existential, it become totally existential in many ways. And so it was friend against friend, neighbor against friend, sometimes family against family, uh, and it was a bloody awful mess, really. And we often don't look at the revolution that way, but uh, it, was, oh. it, was, uh, it was a pretty violent contest. And in the end, so they get to Yorktown in Virginia, and what, and then it, it's still, the war isn't settled for quite a while because Jefferson, what, replaces Franklin in Paris, and they're trying to negotiate something with a man who's slipping into madness, the king. Well, I mean, I, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm so fascinated, fascinated by these time periods that you can read book, have to put that book down, start another one, and it's brilliant. They're brilliant men, and they're smart, and they're tough, but principally, they're brave. I, I'm, my, That's right. yeah, yeah. And they have one quality you have to have above all else, and that is they have to persevere. They understand oh. at that point, if they give up even for a moment, yes, they are finished because yes. the British are, well, they, I, I would just say, put it this way, at the beginning of this war, they are the most powerful military force in the world. Yeah. And to contend with that force, you have to really be shrewd in strategy. You have to be so very, very careful in the way you operate. Your operational planning has to be critical. You have to be tactically aware of how you can do certain things. They had a, Washington had a problem with getting outflanked early in the war, and he will begin to correct those kinds of problems. All this is, it becomes a learning experience, and that's another key factor. So many of these, and I think that's fair about Washington and others, they weren't afraid to learn. Yeah. They didn't think they knew it all. And so you compare that to the attitude of some of the, oh. like Jimmy Burgoyne. Burgoyne yeah. just assumed he knew everything. Oh, the Americans you're gonna, were yeah. stupid yeah. idiots in the country. Yeah. yeah. That sort of thing. What was the, what was the rallying cry? You're going to get Burgoyne. Uh, <laughs> That's they right. would yell it at him. Yeah. And, That's right. and, and, and Washington is with these guys when they're with Forbes and, and he's, I mean, I, I'm so brought to George Washington. I used to have that, my, who was your favorite American? And I used to always kind of lean on Jefferson and, and a lot on Ben Franklin, who I just think is the best anyhow. But it's come back to Washington is the, when he, he was the guy then offered, what, what was the offer they gave to George Washington in, in the end of this? Well, the offer at the beginning was, uh, and this is uh, in June of 1775, he's offered to be commander in chief uh, unanimously, although, well, there are a couple of other folks that were interested, yeah. but uh, he was he was the right guy. Yeah. Yeah. Great selection. That's the first thing that made, yeah. made the yeah. best selection. Yeah. But Washington does say then in accepting this honor, which was going to be, what not, I mean, it becomes an honor because of what he's able to do with it. Mm -hmm. And he does say that he isn't sure he's really worthy to the task. And yeah. he brought that. Here's another characteristic we don't talk about enough. He brought that kind of humility. Yeah. And he's saying that. I don't know whether I'm worthy to the task, but he's going to say in many ways, like a good coach will say to a football team that's in trouble, you know, we're going to give it, we're going to give it our very best try. Yeah. And we'll try to overcome the circumstances so that in the end we prevail with our values and are not buried with their values, or let's say, buried in defeat rather than yeah. sharing a great victory. And the other part of it too, and I'm reading about Abigail and John Adams, mm -hmm. uh, they were they would be killed. I mean, Washington would have been killed for sedition. They would have, you know, he'd have he was turned against the crown. It wasn't a question of you you just come home now. They would they, those men what they would have hung them. Is that what they would have done with them? Uh, what would they have faced? Firing squads? Who knows? That's right. But we don't know. Because they were all in. Right. They, they, put, I, they were all in. It's, it's the difficulty of any kind of hypothetical situation. Yeah. Uh, we know what they did with Nathan Hale. <laughs> he did, he didn't him. get a fair trial. No, no, they hung and, him. And, uh, certainly, but I mean, uh, I don't know, but because there is this kind of gentlemanliness about war, about there, there's some respect for certain kinds of rules of war at the time of the revolution, but it's a strange yeah. combination. Right. And it would be really, it would, I think it would probably a variable would be, do we consider this person a gentleman? Yeah. And Washington might have only been 
thrown in the brig for the rest of his life, of course, yeah. well, the Gale or some prison yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in England or something like that. But who knows? They might have just strung him up on the spot. There's, there's, sure. we'll just, we have no way of knowing these things. Well, a Abigail and John Adams write letters to each other, and she's leaving because the British are there. And uh, 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 to me, it's like we, we're watching crazy elections now. Oh, you're not risking your life. And those those right. men and women, they did. That's wow. right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. They um, lived in a world of danger. I, I want you to do this show again. I just we just started beginning, and I'm realizing yeah. how important you are to talk to about all of this. What, what's and oh, please, what in all of your study and all these years, and I know it's a lousy way to end this, but what's the significant moment for this time period? Do you believe that above all stands out? You that pick. Is that is a great question uh, because I have so many different ways of saying, yeah. I guess, significance. But I think in the end, the willingness of people, so many people, although not, it's not a large segment yeah. of the population, to give their all to prevail and not continue under a monarchical system, but rather a system of laws as opposed to a system of of uh, what we could say aristocratic control. Yes. Um, that that is really that is the great that is the great accomplishment. Yeah. That is the concept yeah. of the republic, in which we all the people can play a part uh, in deciding what is best for us in the future. And I would say I hope we keep trying to do a good job of yeah. handling the present yeah. and the future. I always come away with they broke this notion of a national church and the divine right of kings or that there are people that are born just simply lucky sperm club members who are dukes and barons and earls and kings and queens and princes and princesses and that got broke at yorktown and 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 i think it opens up a door that will begin to end the british empire any and all empires well, now, because of those incredible men and women. That's right. I, I think that was so powerful. Come do the show again. I mean, we'll get in touch with you. You're a gift. Yeah. Uh, it's Professor James Kirby, or James Kirby, James Kirby. Actually, it's your middle name, James Kirby Martin. Yeah. Trying to yeah. do how bad I am. Yeah. That's um, no problem. Oh. Yeah. But th thank you. I mean, I, 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 I really enjoy talking to, to people like you. And, and I, I will be happy to. Talk about various subjects with you. It's oh like, man, I, we can really just to do so. Anyway, yeah. thank you for the thank, time. I, I, I enjoyed our conversation. And, I did too. Uh, I, I appreciated the opportunity. The professor's book is now up on the screen. Mark Crowley, thank you very much. Salem, thank you. Professor, we'll talk again. Thank you, sir. Be kind. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you.